Here you are. Chirping away. Chirp, chirp, chirp. Chirp, chirp, chirp. That's what we're doing. Chirp, chirp, chirping. Really pathetic. Folks, come on now. We're doing the, interrupting this current corona cricketism to bring you behind the woodshed. This is cricketude busting episode BTWRLM 370. Uh, folks, of all months now I've been telling you what needed to be done. People have to step up. What we're going to go through today, I'm going to get hopefully to this uh, Wisconsin decision. Yeah, very interesting. I'll look very carefully at these cases. And what I've told you wasn't going to happen, has not been happening. It probably won't be happening. And yet here is a decision that if you look inside it, it'll tell you what you have to do. And if you don't, you get what you get what's coming to you because you didn't respond. Again, all these times I've been saying this is not to uh, pin down everybody for being, uh, blame you for being apathetic, which you are, but not as a judgment. And yet the, the authorities that you live under, whether you want to agree with them or not, are telling us exactly what has to happen. And so today, I, I, finally people coming along, more and more people are starting to see it, but they still see it as a question. And I said, that's, that's a bad thing for us. America is becoming more like a prison than you might think. No, folks, this is a prison. Right? And it's also having a different consequence. I don't even know about reading these articles because they're so they're steps behind. They tell the truth, but they tell it after the fact. And we were supposed to be ahead of the point. And it, it'll delineate all the horrors that are going on. And as I've been saying, you're you're letting them. As the response we get, the peaceful, warm summer day, forever since for since 9/11. And it's uh, there. I told you in the beginning of coming in through the beginning of the year. Hindsight 2020, folks, it was going to be Operation Hindsight 2020, and the big play there will be whether or not you finally step up with your hindsight or whether with the hindsight they know you didn't respond, they're going to get their way. And sure enough, they came right out of the gate. I can almost stunning how fast they pulled that off. And I've also told you how they would do it. They would do it likely because of the what you all started to show you could do since about 2012 or so. so. We started seeing the news reflection, and, oh, they're catching on. And so this is your time, folks. This is going to be the time you have to move forward. And I predicted, if you will, prediction is kind of looking at the facts of what's going on. You were going to catch up, and they were going to have to, they were getting panicky, so that they were kind of stuck to having to do the ultimate response, which was the medical power, police power, which I identified for you was essentially medical martial law, which was really not even the cover of that either, because I told you it was a military consequence that you've always been under, and I put, proved all this out in the statutes as we went to those emergency statutes. The emergency statutes are under the military code. And I said, that's just sitting there all the time. You don't even really understand this false front that you live in. Everyone wants to call it this, what, holograph, hologram. They don't, they don't, people don't understand in fact, I'm, I'm really looking at uh, the, the Twitter feed is really months behind what I've been telling you. And I'm looking in now, and I'm trying to come up with a nice way to say this, but anybody that uses COVID-19 and then tries to attach a consequence to it doesn't know what they're talking about. It's absolutely clear. I don't think anybody knows what they're actually talking about. How can I say that? Because I've done the, I've shown you what, how to analyze the words. And I'm going to do it again today. And when I get to the end of this one, and I better get moving, I'll show you how to do this. If you haven't figured it out, if you didn't go to your statutes to figure out how to extract yourself from your self-imposed quarantine under the order of an authorita, uh, I'll point to you one simple definition that'll show you if you speak strictly of COVID-19 or anything like that, you speak, speak on the label, you've missed the whole point, you've missed the artifice of the deal. And you're going to be suffering what you will, and you're going to get your thrills out of watching other people do things, or even including yourself, essentially doing the same thing we've seen over and over again, even now going inside the legislative building, knocking on the door and asking for permission instead of handing them a demand notice to get ready to throw the bums out. And you're going to hear this Wisconsin court case actually talks about that as an option. But America is becoming more like a prison. No, America is a prison, folks. I don't know. Again, this thing came so clear to me. If I hadn't ever seen it before, it was before that. But it finally hit me right, exactly what it was when I was in a jail myself. 
and I told you that's when I was attempting to out CSD's child services, the child abuse system, under the color of child rights of child, and uh, the guy collected me up when I was going to do a document. I was get almost done with my documentary, and they definitely changed my life a bit. The point was, I got to see something. It wasn't. It wasn't just in the books, if you will. It wasn't just in the opinions and opinions of people. They got to see a system from the, if you will, from the inside. And that re- that looked to me to be nothing more than the extension, literally looking from a jail cot bed out a door they finally opened after three weeks, because they had me locked down pretty good. And I saw the the pod outside. And I realized there was a bigger pod out there to enter in. And I realized that the whole town was a big pod. And you were dependent on where you were. And there was one a couple worse than where I was sitting. It get more and more restricted. Your pods are restricted depending on where the warden and the guards want you to be. How compliant you are all the time. And I realized then we live in a big prison. Because we weren't those vigilant, educated masses. We were pretty relatively idiot to the whole thing and also not active against the stopping, the arresting of violations to us. And the occupying force takes advantage at every turn of that. And so we're, again, we have a thing to do. Let me get there, try to get there, move on here. Uh, something that I've, been, I've told you, the way this thing is wired, you have to assert your rights. This is going to be the theme today for sure. This is part of the, if I can use it, maybe even use it as the title, uh, the artifice of the deal, and, and reflecting to the a president who used that as a book to come in and also is producing artifice in order to continue this on you, and nobody's stepping up to do the most basic things to show, in a simple way, how this thing that you're experiencing today, the thing that I predicted, if, if not in, in specific, specific point, in generality, would it be coming, and how you would respond was going to be key. And how to respond to that was going to be key. And how telling you what it was is going to be how. At least when you start, then you can find how to, again, the, the path and the trail. And you haven't. Is this this thing that keeps coming down uh, and you see them expanding well beyond and in furtherance of the trauma-based condition where the total society is under control and you're going to live underneath those, uh, 20, those 2030, Agenda 2030 goals of austerity and controlled living. And so you see all the implementation coming in, but here in federal court, you live in a prison, they get to do what they want until someone challenges it, but finally someone finally challenged this. I don't understand why this took so long. Federal court rules, every drug dog in entire state is unreliable. Will alert to nothing just to please the master. If that wasn't obvious, folks, I've mentioned that before. In fact, the Illinois cases comes to mind now as I just speak to that. Uh, the Utah uh, appeals court now has just ruled that all the police canines in the state are uh, in the states are unreliable. This article asks, then aren't all the states unreliable? And uh, that would be if their certification program is the same. And they kind of attached a well, they did attach a scientific principle against using dogs to trigger the triggering of a dog in a scientific sense that they said in this report that the certification program did not utilize double-blind testing and sufficient amounts of double-blind testing to prove that the dog wasn't just trying to please the matcher under natural instincts to do so. And you have to understand, look back now, all the times a drug dog, at least in Utah, has been done to incriminate, to, to uh, criminalize people and put them in, in, in a cage. This should have been up front. The judiciary should have never let this go. But to see it today and finally gets overturned is what I keep telling you about your, you really, if you don't want to live in this type of a prison, it's, you, it's up to you to stand up. And I just can't understand how millions of you wouldn't just inundate this system. And just by that, you would show the folly in the decision of the Wisconsin court to insist. And that might do something too. I told you, you live on the right side of history if you get on the right side of this history. It's going a w- bad way, but it's your, up to you. No, the authorities will only look at those that will step up. So here it is. The canines are not certifiable. They try, There was no double-blind test put on them to pick out drugs. Extend that to everything else, and I want to extend. The reason why this even became even more important was they're going to use dogs to sniff out corona, uh, COVID-19. 
Okay, so here you are. And there, we needed this decision right in time, too, as well. And here, this has never been something I, I would have understood. This is certified as law and evidence, lawful evidence entered in, that the courts were supposed to protect against this nonsense. And to have this time, much time come out while a court finally finds out that this is the you know, scientific uh, application, a uh, certification for this, is no different than the lack of scientific certification over anybody that just mentions COVID as a re related cause or a cause for anything or data or relies on the data or anything. I guess I'm going to say it again. I don't think people truly appreciate when the CDC and the FDA agrees there is no test what that actually meant. You may, it might, you might just stop. Might as well just stop talking about COVID nineteen, because you're not going to get the next thing. And you can find that stated in the Wisconsin case, which they overlook as well. Which is what I'm telling you: until you assert what's the full measure of your condition and your rights, you will have none. You will have only what they allow to you, just like the prison we live in. And that's going to be the distinction. They've already cut, made that rule. It's in the Wisconsin case. It says. You'll assert the rights that you, you have to assert to protect yourself. And we're only going to listen to the ones that you assert. But moving on, okay, so your canines in Utah are no good. The question is about the 50 states. you got to go look at their certification program. Go ask them quickly if they have a double blind. Refer to this case. Tell them to shut down their canines. And then you insist that the court was derelict to not test, te check this. You send this another letter to the judiciary saying that the, the judiciaries of the 50 several states have been derelict not to to confine this and put it go make it go the way of feeling for head bumps on your head to find out your your mental capacity. At any rate, the, this annoys me too as I get start talking about it. But keep moving. It's not just that you're in a prison. You live in a military consequence. I've explained this numerous times in, dumb, in multiple ways. And I'd like uh, again, no one answers it back to show me that it can be in, the things I've shown you interpreted are interpreted any different. And I won't go through the, the lineage again, but uh, we have it coming out. Of all the abilities that the United States government has to get a thing into the world, Trump says he would mobilize the military to distribute coronavirus vaccine when it's ready. So he's going to use the military because it's a military bioweapon. All right? So if you haven't seen that part and you think Trump's uh, the art of the deal is not the artifice of the deal, He's actually staying, agreeing, continuing to distribute a coronavirus vaccine. The title, coronavirus vaccine, in that title, tells you either he doesn't know what he's talking about or he wants you to believe that something's going to happen that can't. Co common cold vaccine's not possible, folks. And they're not naming. See, coronavirus is a one of a group. They're not naming any one. And then we get to the question about where's the test. And I said there is none. And so now where are you at? He's going to distribute a vaccine for something that can't exist on a thing that hasn't been identified. And he's using the military to do it. Should have been all you needed to know from that title. When I've told you he could have fixed it, he could still fix this at any time, actually. He could fix this entire thing. And he's not doing it either. And not, certainly none of your states are going to do it, and none of your courts are going to do it. In fact, they abandoned Washington. They abandoned ship and identified that the few days after they did it. And I told you, your, your whole civil government has failed here, folks. You better come together. And then I referred again back bef just weeks before to the Virginia Constitution that we did the so-called Second Amendment analysis of what the people are given to do. And it's so simple in their Bill of Rights. It's so simple. You just have to set up the elements. So while we are doing all this, while the, I told you the continuation of the so-called Patriot Act, P-A-T-I-R-O-T Act, was going to be moved, here we have the Senate votes to allow FBI to look at your web browsing history without a warrant. The thing that caught me was not that they were going to do that, because this is, I told you, they were going to, they're going to tighten the screws on the uh, Patriot Act, okay, and what still exists. Someone was saying that the Patriot Act uh, went away, but I'm not so sure. I looked around it. I don't see that it's completely away. Parts of it have died and gone away, but there's still parts that are. Uh, this has to be part of that. But what struck me on this is the FBI to, uh, allows the FBI to look at your web browsing history, which means they can do it, folks. Okay? So they can do it. They can get into your system, which means all the browser companies have failed. All the all any computer system people have failed. They, they already have access into your systems. 
they've been looking at this the whole time and don't anyway so the point is the senate which is for the state representation in the in the government federal government is passing a, a law or wants to pass a law that allows that the fbi can look I- into your browsers and they actually reference this in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Just right there, in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic, when they mention COVID as anything, this whole story is based in the fraud and a fraudulent reliance. COVID is nothing more than symptoms. Pandemic is outside, and it's a suggestion, is not a cause. So while they have you looking at nothing, they're actually enforcing, like I said, they're tweaking down more authority for the FBI to look at your web browsers without a warrant. Now, whether that's going to be constitutional will be how many of you will step up once this becomes law and stops it and shuts it down. And if millions of you would just do that everywhere, we've got millions to do this, folks. Just bury the judiciary with their own words. It's time for us to exercise. Actually, I really think this would be kind of fun to watch this system this parasitic amoeba turn into jelly right before our eyes because it can't keep up with the demand of its own impositions if you understood what they were. And I, I know some people are going to say, but I understand, but I don't think you do because I would see more than a handful of people trying to fight their way out of this thing, small business businesses no less, and then do the wrong arguments. And maybe we'll get to that too, how that's been working. And I've been suggesting to you how that what they're doing is wrong and another thing i'll throw in on top of this seems seemingly always no attorney will argue what they have to argue and you're going to see this in the cases coming so we're under the military consequence that while it's happening the senate's going to have to give the fbi this unprecedented view into your browser history if you think that's all they can do uh diluted i, I guess it is uh, so this this interrogation this surveillance is not disconnected also, with I've told you, the Agenda 2030, the United States government's up with it. The Bar Association's up with it. They're going to promote it all as best they can. You saw the internal documentation of the Bar Association's own work, um, House resolutions, that they're saying that. This comes out at the same time while the covid nineteen's up. Now, COVID-19 can be mentioned, but it can't be utilized in any way to be doing anything. You can mention it as a as the label. But it doesn't, isn't anything more than that. And I'll get to the law that one rule, one definition that points that out, how you, everybody can attack this uh, through that one. If you haven't listened, you're not listening to what I've been saying, or you didn't, you got confused, or you haven't really gone to your statutes to look around a bit and familiarize yourself. You're, and I get that only because only a few of you will contact me and, 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 and work, work, try to start to work some of this out. And yet we see people that, even a woman in Dallas, she just stepped up and just said, I'm not, I can't do this anymore. But she gave the wrong answers. And the judge gave her an answer, and the Supreme Court came back with the help of political parties in the other side, the other attorneys who didn't do it right either, to continue the problem. Remember, if you don't bring a continuing question, it has to end. So I don't know if anybody read into that, these habeases that I'm telling you to do. When they're continued, I hope you pick this up. It's not over, and that wasn't the right argument they gave. It's still giving the question and the presumption over to the government. That should have been ended. And the only way you can do that is attack the validity of those uh, um, governor's orders. The sidewalk labs, while well, this is going on, and this is the imposition of this, and then we see the ramifications like Cuomo complaining he's not getting his tax money now after shutting everybody down. The, the disconnected insanity that is. Uh, Sidewalk Labs cancels plan to build high-tech neighborhood in Toronto amid COVID-19. These guys don't quite don't quite get what's going to happen here. The austerity, looking for money and looking for control, needs to have both, and they didn't get it. And Google, uh, Sidewalk Labs, a Google-affiliated company, remember big data, private big data, is abandoning its plan to build a high-tech neighborhood on Toronto's waterfront, citing what it calls unprecedented economic uncertainty. That's what they called it. But when you notice what Toronto did, and I don't know, I'm hoping you folks up in Toronto were help actually pressure on this to stop it. And they made the, the Toronto City Council or whoever was made this decision to back off. They constrained the sidewalk flag lab experiment from some 190 acres or so. I'm sorry, I don't understand the hectare thing, so I'll, I'll say acres for those of you from Kanukistan. I appreciate if you would just translate my... my, my uh, dimensions my sizing my units uh two down to 4.8 or so you can't you can't do a surveillance system model on 4.8 acres is the problem you can't implement autonomous vehicles and a 5g in 4.8 acres adequately 
you needed apparently about 190. The economic uncertainty was how would they perform all these models forward that would get them public-private partnership monies to prove out as a model city to do so to the greater Toronto on 4.8 acres couldn't happen. And so whatever you guys were doing in Toronto to stop this and get that thing, get that those city council people to back off a bit, put some constraints, that d worked, folks. So congratulations. Uh, that's all I, I want to talk about there. We need to move on. And uh, right in the same week, we see that very fact about the five not 5G necessarily. It's the, there's only two things they're using 5G for that the government wants it for, any government wants it for, and it's the Internet of Things, those surveillance devices everywhere and in everything, and for autonomous cars. Volvo CEO, in quote, in cities, the private car is not a very practical concept. Just off the title, this is Volvo already involved with looking at city metropolitan area autonomous vehicle conditions that are probably running underneath the uh, clean and green air energy label fraud that this is going to be also cars that will uh, autonomously travel around they need to get rid of the rest of the cars so this is right on the heels of google telling you they can't do it on 4.8 acres and i would say no they can't they can probably do it on 190 think about what 190 acres looks like you could put a tidy little stack them and pack them in something like that and have a lot of autonomous vehicles where other vehicles are out and people have a certain place to be. As I told you, these intermodal hub transportation corridors will likely have no people interacting with them. And so we're seeing it still on, it's still moving forward, but we also see there's a limit. They can't start it in 4.8. They can't start something like this as a model in 4.8 acres. So I found this was pretty interesting coming together underneath this COVID and that COVID is actually... They're calling it, they're using this pandemic, this label, to actually move things forward is a corporate type of thing. Okay, so again, the global corporate governance is right here. Uh, let me just see here if I, Volvo CEO Hankin Samuelson expects the pandemic to accelerate change in the car industry. How would that be, folks? The pandemic is just a, a suggestion. How does this thing have any force and effect? Is their decision to utilize this as the vector to bring in their condition. They're all agreeable to it. There's no basis for it, though. See, using pandemic is no different than, has a causation, is no different than saying COVID-19 has any causation. It just can't. And everyone believing so is allowing the courts to get away with not having to identify the point. Uh, the second element in the, in the definition you will come to, even the word they use, uh, even in the term, the second element sits right there for people to use, and that's why you're seeing nobody use the term they're supposed to. On the heels of this and during the week, uh, Club of Rome calls for green reboot after pandemic. So pandemic becomes this point that has, it's no point. It's a suggestion to the world that we've moved from, we can't contain a thing, which they never identified, and that's the the secret to the joke, the, the punchline to the joke here. And, and now we have to move to mitigation. And I told you that's has risk management, not hazard. Totally different concepts. I've talked about all this. But the Club of Rome pops its nose back up. I told you they were sitting right there. What Greta couldn't do, this pandemic did. They're all focusing on it. And they're talking for a green reboot after pandemic. I don't know if you've looked around, but they're now actually scientists are coming back out and telling you and advancing the, the 2030 problem of the potential that we go into a, a cold spell, maybe even a minor a minor ice age. I don't know if it's going to go that deep, but it doesn't matter. This was told to us in more scientific terms, not just this agenda back in the 70s. And so now the green reboot after, but what's the reboot? What's the green reboot after you've shut down all of society and you're living in austerity? You're living in it now. You're living in Agenda 2030 in some places, not quite to the extent you will be. Okay, so there are, Club of Rome comes back up. These are where this stuff, these are like the think tanks that start up. The writers state that we can use the science and de, uh, design economies that will mitigate the threats of climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, and pandemics. Now they've lumped it together. As I told you, they were what Greta couldn't do. This thing, this pandemic is going to do for them. What is this? Again, it's the WHO, not the uh, rock group and not the OWL, the World Health Organization, the Brokers for Pharma, organized criminal syndicate that advances these things all these things, all these agendas, because they're in a, they're also in the UN. And this is written by a, a 
the Technocracy website. In fact, science has already designed such a system. It's called Sci uh, Technocracy, a.k.a. Sustainable Development. Okay, so Club of Rome is now be trying to become relevant. They're trying to say, well, you need an even deeper reset for for a green reboot. All right, so it's gone off, folks. You got They, they locked their system up with this whole thing, uh, but after the pandemic. So it says COVID-19 coronavirus has forced entire countries into lockdown mode. Let me stop there. Terrified citizens around the world and triggered a financial meltdown. Terrified citizens, what did I tell you? Trauma-based fears. What I told you was coming. Let's get it back just in the first three words. The, the COVID-19 coronavirus. COVID-19 coronavirus now has a second term. Coronavirus added to that. Is that a proper statement to make? It is in the general, isn't it? We have a disease and a potential agent, don't we? There it is. I said another hit. Uh, that could be. But which coronavirus is not stated? So we don't really know. And there is no test, folks. So now we're ended. The COVID-19 coronavirus has for us is an impossible statement to make. It hasn't done anything. It's the people in government that have that you haven't brought into check, and particularly each one of you on your asserting your rights of how what they've done is wrong. Not against your rights is what, what they want you to do. I'm telling you you attack the validity of the orders up front. And there's I'm tr been week after week slowly working out how to tell you I'm down to one sentence now how do you can do that pretty simply and then you build from there and then we got some excellent uh, people coming out that if you could tie into their statements and then maybe you put them on task to maybe uh, make the make a, an evidence an affidavit for you into your court whatever one you want to do to stop this harassment against you this this crime this treason against you there, people are coming online to tap I've got some links to a couple videos at least one in particular that's even better than the one that's coming out for the pandemic, um, the plague of, of corruption that I, uh, the woman, I can't remember her name now, uh, Mitovich or something. Anyway, a new one's popped up that she sounds, she's a whole lot better regarding your evidence, folks. And she's a lot, uh, there's no baggage around the one that just popped up that I just heard a video of. Uh, but the coronavirus, okay, so we got Club of Rome. And then, interestingly, connected, not connected, coronavirus drains Vatican coffers as income falls and deficits loom. So this is the same same guy that said he wants austerity for you. All of a sudden, when the pandemic, uh, the uh, the pan, so-called as pandemic is declared, and the the uh, governments shut down economies, the artifice of the deal, the head, uh, the guy who wrote the book. Now works the other side of it, not the art of the deal. Well, art never met different than artifice, actually, when you go look. The artifice of the deal now becomes apparent. I'm actually starting to wonder if there's a sec um, another, there's a battle going on in the financial sector as well and, uh, on this. But anyway, coronavirus drains the Vatican because they can't get the tourism, which is what the green reboot would say you only can survive on tourism. You're finding out that because of uh, these types of um, fraudulent pandemics, your tourism goes down to nothing. It's destroyed. The evidence of the people that are telling you you should live in austerity, when you apply the very principles they're telling you, they start telling you that there's no money to do a thing. Vatican imposes strict cost cutting as coronavirus hits income. I have to when I use coronavirus I ask which one? Because there is no test. And so this is a lie statement coming from the Vatican. No, the infallible one? I don't think so. Vatican economy minister expects 25 to 45 percent drop in income. I found that word used interesting. I didn't think that they were taxable. I didn't think they made income. Revenues, different than income. Revenues from Vatican Museum halts a pandemic-induced closure. But it was as pandemic-induced. And how is that? When all it is is suggestion from going from containment to mitigation from a WHO, a non-governmental agency. No one is allowed to be fired despite austerity measures. There. There's what I've been talking about all this time. This is what it's all about. Austerity. They're, having, they're getting their way and no one's stepping up and defending themselves as I've been suggesting. Now, another ramifications of this whole green reboot, it's, it's working perfectly, folks. They're just trying to get you to think like it failed or something. This is an extension of what's going on. Uh, I've told you to be careful about your food. Uh, not, not the only one. Again, there's lots of people starting to see and have seen 
We have a problem with the food. We saw the destruction. I've reported about the destruction of food. I've told you that the artifice of the deal that gave money instead of food production to farmers will not feed you. And the, now, we, now the real supply and demand starts to kick in as well as austerity and lack of supply. U.S. Grocer, grocery j costs jump the most in 46 years, led by rising prices for meat and eggs. Again, do I need to read more? I guess I could, but I got things more important. I'm telling you, these were predictable responses that anybody that it was any think tank could figure out. But they're playing on how you how you would respond or not, and you didn't. And so they're continuing. Prices that Americans paid for eggs. I'll read a little bit. Eggs, meat, cereal, and milk shot higher. Oh no, they're only dumping milk everywhere. They said there's no place for the milk to go. No place for the taters, folks. Oh, but they shot higher in April as people flocked to grocery stores to stock up on food among government lockdowns designed to slow the spread of COVID-19. What are they saying? Slow the spread of COVID-19 is what? Symptoms of the flu. That's what this whole thing was always on. We've missed the whole point. The Even flattening the curve was supposed to give the chance to the hospitals to keep up, if you believed it. Now, I think flu season's over. Uh, okay, I'm not going to go. You can go around and find it. There's no problems. This thing should have been over based on that premise for flu symptoms, strictly flu symptoms. Because of the spread of flu symptoms is what they said right there. Not because of a virus, if you notice what, if you understand what you're reading. Because of the spread of flu symptoms, something that's never happened before, every flu season, all of a sudden your prices are going up. No, this is as a cover for the destruction that they're putting on you that I hear crickets over. Apparently, and probably so, well, maybe one of them, one of them's coming away. You should have been doing a little bit. Maybe crickets don't eat eggs, meat, and milk. But okay, then I saw it. But what about your cereal, folks? You think you need to eat cereal? They're stealing your cereal, you crickets. They're making it more expensive. And you're not working to cover that. Seems like a pretty, pretty well thought out plan to me. None of you are stepping up to stop it against your rights. Citizens, uh, so here, what do the citizens do? Interesting, good stuff. People are trying to support each other. I'm, I'm on the record here that this is the, the wrong way, although in an instance this is fine. They should have had a group of people that was sufficient to block this enforcement here and then move where? Move to the government that's implementing the, the cops to come beat you down. And what do what? Not work on the administrative side. Say the governor's orders are are fraudulent and treasonous, and show them how. Now, citizens form barricade to stop code enforcement officers from entering Fresno Diner. The Fresno Police Department says a group of citizens barricaded the door of a popular waffle restaurant and refused to allow code enforcement officers to enter the building. I guess this was a collective lego my ego. And so we're blocking now waffle shop doorways from the police code enforcement. So you got to listen here. This is code. Consider your mind to say administrative. And this is going to become kind of a, it is a critical observation here to keep moving because the Wisconsin case talks to this as well. And the Wisconsin case seems important to me because it makes delineations that you all could learn from on, and you'll see what I've been saying on why you need to do things, how the courts will treat you or treat what you're stating and where the limits are they will go if you and that they will have a limit if you don't stay, say so correctly. So the Fez, Fresno Police Department now is a code enforcement officer. Well, what code? It's, I'm telling you, it's going to be that military code that you don't really understand. But the poli people are standing in the way. Okay, that's good. You're showing a resistance. But you're there, and the police are there and justified until you throw off what occupies you. And so while I embrace the fact that you're responding... I'm continually on record, you're not responding correctly. In the face of courts now finally, five and a half months later, courts finally coming out to show those that step up will see a balance at least of the of the dynamic. And you're not, there is no restriction if you do it the way the Wisconsin court I'll get to here tells you that I've been telling you myself. And you should do real quickly, and I've been suggesting for each one of you in restraint of your liberty, whatever liberty concern you're restrained in, that's a habeas. But this one is now court for churches, and I talked about the churches that have won when they've asserted these things. 
not to the level I'd like to see, but neither here nor there when you win back some rights that you were expecting and that's all you're limiting yourself to. Well, I guess you're you're fine with that. A court halts ban on mass gatherings at Kentucky churches. A federal court halted the Kentucky governor's temporary ban on mass gatherings from applying to in-person religious services, clearing the way for Sunday church services. I don't know what what else to read. What they end up, you could read it yourself. I'll just paraphrase it. What they did is they said, we have, we're complying with the order, as I told you the last week, you comply with the, 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 the limitations within the constraint for protection, like the six-foot social distancing, however your opinion is on it, that's what they're saying they're complying with. And that is where the limit is for the police power relative to this. They start out saying this is a temporary ban. No one challenged that it shouldn't be exhaust. It shouldn't be a ban at all because it would it didn't actually meet what it needed to. We'll get to that point as I've just given you hints throughout this time uh, that they're actually saying they're going to comply with what the governor's order said to do and therefore they, there is no more force and effect relative to that and they have the right to, to, to go and, and meet. It's, I don't even think this actually has to do with the First Amendment because I think it's a compliance with the order condition. The excess enforcement over which is what their uh, people are arguing, which is a normally okay, but not in the condition that we find ourselves relative to the extent of these orders. And so here we have another. You challenge it, you're likely going to be a, a, ahead. You challenge it uh, somewhat, even somewhat correctly. And this was the compliance with the order and the the extra enforcement over that was unlawful. So as long as you're complying and you can show that, you're going to you're going to show well in the in the case. So here's another one, Kentucky. Move on to Wisconsin. Now we're under the Wisconsin case. Very interesting. You know, I read when I read through some of this uh, this order and st- the uh, decision here, I'm just wondering what see the the court allowed when you read the order, this court allowed an agency officer to utilize, to defer to the statutes that were given to her. The legislature was suing her. We're going to see that in a second. And so what I found is that they make a comment, and I'll read that in a second. They uh, look past the dy- they look past the legitimacy and look past challenging the governor's order because nobody did. And they focus squarely on the administrative agency's officials to uh, to an extent. The legislature did that. This is an interesting case. This case says that the legislature's job is done when it makes the law, and if the executive, or as unseemly as it would be, it, it operates in excess of that, uh, the legislature, for the most part, doesn't really have standing as far as a dissenting opinion came through. And that's the troubling aspect of some of these things. The Wisconsin High Court tosses out governor's stay-at-home order. The case doesn't actually say that. Wisconsin Supreme Court struck out Don, uh, Governor Don Evers' coronavirus stay-at-home order Wednesday, ruling that uh, his administration overstepped its authority when it extended it for another month without consulting legislators. That's not actually how this thing happened. Actually, if I, unless I have this thing completely misunderstood, they said that the governor's order was not in question. They said that the administration had an independent statutory authority from which to work and was. But that, ultimately, they didn't follow the rules on how to promulgate rules. This is They called it an order that was actually a rule. Now, that's the real interesting problem. This Your eyes will roll back trying to keep up with this one. How an order is a rule that an order might be a rule or not, and when and how is not wasn't really clear in my mind after I mind-numbingly read through it. I think I understood less about it after I got done reading than I thought I did understand it going in. Notwithstanding all that, this uh, order comes by way of Scott Walker. I think he's the governor there. I could be wrong. Wisconsin, I don't pay attention, folks, that way. I'm looking at the particularities of things. Uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court knocks down stay-at-home order. I don't know why he's uh, all happy about that. It, was, it would have been his order, but actually it doesn't. He actually, here's a Twitter where he, say, he points out a section of the code that he's talking about, about uh, the court stating, we conclude the emergency order 28 is a rule. Rule. The order is a rule. Remember, it's not the governor's order that's on it. This is the administrator's, health administrator's order, which is a rule controlling precedent in this court. 
and they are therefore subject to statutory emergency rulemaking procedure established by the legislature. So this part of this order that he's highlighted says that the legislature makes the law and the administ- executive has to follow it. The rules are to implement what the legislature makes as law. So keep track of how this works, like in Civics 101 here. People seem to disregard this, but it's very important in tracking through and, and not making the mistakes I saw in the first story uh, relative to what they said. Emergency um, Order 28 is a general order of general application within the meaning of Wisconsin Statute 22.7.01, which defines rule. Now here we have defines, because I'm going to get onto a define here at the end of this, hopefully get to it defines rule, quote rule, according to the, Lee, the rulemaking procedures of Wisconsin Statute 22.7 were required to be followed, were required to be followed during the promulgation of Order 28. Because they were not, Emergency Order 28 is unenforceable. Now, just stopping here, isn't that interesting? They enforced it up until someone said no. And I think we're going to have to change this. I, this interpret this imposition by the judiciary to wait until something comes along because it's presumed the government does right has to be changed here. But anyway, that's my opinion. You can believe different, or you can not believe believe different. They believe the same and not do anything. This is how this thing works. There's reasons why they give presumptions of right to the government, but in this case, where they haven't looked at the very first point either administratively, in rule, or order, or whatever the heck they want to call it, or by the government's federal, um, the governor's order, which is under police power, they fa- the courts have failed. Everybody failed to assert a very particular thing that's mentioned and overlooked in the order, uh, the, gov- the decision, excuse me, of the court. Accordingly, the rules have to be followed, because they were not, the emergency order is unforce- unenforceable. But it wasn't unenforceable, was it? It precipitated a lawsuit before it could be unenforceable. And this is something that you have to be willful in when you see, and this is the hard part, this is where the other part you realize you live in a prison. It's not presumption on the posterity and your innocence. It's that these lawful orders are, or these orders are deemed, presumed, without a chance of rebuttal, to be lawful. And they're not. And uh, my reading was that any, no officer, no official has the right to, violate you on a unlawful order. That's a felony. That's those felonies I've been telling you about. That's a color of authority that comes in properly. This woman might be under a ton of problems here if the Wisconsin people would just step up. But the court's going to give a little bit of license to the to this administrator, giving her said, but, but instead of doing this, instead of fighting this, why don't you just go ahead and make the rule pursuant to the emergency procedures? And so they're not looking at the order, or the governor's order at all. And I, this is a general, across the nation failure, in my view. No, view, nobody is challenging the cause for which police power is being invoked. I've even told you that there's time that has been charged out, the excess of the Constitution limitation or the statute limitations. That's a good one too, but it doesn't challenge the validity of the order from which this is being done at all, and neither would it do it in this case. They did not challenge the basis, though they mentioned what it should have been. Anyway, that's what was came through on the Scott, Walk, Scott Walker tweet. That's what I got the link to go through. Now I'm going to read some stuff here from the website, and, um, and we'll see what the standards are and what the ideas and what the court's talking about relative to this. It gives us an idea of the principles I've been telling you are there and working that uh, we don't like doing it, but it's required. If you want to be more than living in the prison that you're living in, that's uh, vigilant, educated masses, this has to step up man and woman by man and woman to go do this. As I was telling you, when you got all the men and women in Virginia together, you have a, an article there in, the, in their Constitution Bill of Rights to guide you in mass independent of these guys. But uh, here's, the, here's the Wisconsin order in part. As we said, now what I should say here, i got to prep this up a bit, just a little bit. This is the Wisconsin legislature suing the secretary-designee, Andrea Palm, 
and a bunch of other people's in their in their uh, people officials in their official capacities as executives of the Wisconsin Department of Health Services respondents. The original action. So this is the Constitution. We'll say who can file an original action. And you'll see now the legislature can against the executive uh, agency. Okay, and so. You gotta read how this, how the balance of power is here and what the court, the Wisconsin courts will allow to the legislature and what it wouldn't, wouldn't allow. It's pretty interesting. And I'm a little concerned that they're uh, taking, uh, they do make, they say generally the legislature could not. But the word generally there is the savings clause to where they can. And that's how I started learning how to read. That's what savings clauses are. When the court comes in generally you can't, there's some things you can. You're looking for those things that you can. And then you point to that statement that says it generally. Uh, so we go on. As they start to say, and I'm up at 20, page 26. It's a little bit difficult to get through, but we're gonna, I'll do my best here to move this, uh, move this discussion on. At uh, page 26, at sec, uh, paragraph 41. As we said at the beginning of this decision, the governor's emergency powers are not challenged by the legislature. And Palm does not rely on the governor's emergency powers. That statement in this decision, and I'll try not to, I'll just read through this because the points that they say are important. That makes that AP story completely wrong. That right there, the governor's powers were not challenged by the legislature in this case, even though the AP article says they were. And Palm does not rely on the government governor's emergency powers. The, the health department has their own. Okay, so this is a critical misreporting of the case, and it's critical to understanding that the governor's Emergency powers are never challenged. They haven't been yet across this nation, and they necessarily have to. They have to be. Constitutional law goes on. Constitutional law has generally permitted the governor to respond to emergencies without the need of legislative approval. Quote, with no time for ex anti deliberation and no metric for ex post assessments, the executive's capacity for swift Vigorous and secretive action are at a premium. Folks, you think you live in a prison where the governor's secretive action are at a premium? You think this is a republic if you could keep it may not have been kept to keep you out of the dark here? No, they're going to keep you in the dark if it, they can plausibly agree, uh, plausibly state that they need the secret. Do you think this is like national security? Absolutely. This is how they're taking you down. Going on, but but the governor's emergency powers are premised on the inability to secure legislative approval given the nature of the emergency. This is the things you have to check out when you're reading for your state. For example, if a forest fire breaks out, there is no time for debate. Action is needed. Not talk, folks. Action. Don't complain. Act and protect to assert. Action is needed when the fire breaks out. I've said this COVID nonsense is a conflagration against you. Action is needed. The governor could declare an emergency and respond accordingly. But in the case of pandemic, which lasts month after month, the governor cannot rely on emergency powers indefinitely. I need to interject. There was two other statements, and I don't know Wisconsin law. Someone in Wisconsin can correct me if I'm wrong. Go look at your statutes. The CDC was consistent with this. A couple states have been consistent. Whether it's consistent in Wisconsin, I don't know. A pandemic is not even in their vernacular. They'd either be talking about an outbreak. They'd be talking about, or an, um, and I'll just limit it to, a, a epidemic. Okay? A communicable disease. Okay, so they've got it wrong here. The pandemic isn't what evokes it. It's being able to find a cause that's over a territory and causing the the catastrophic problem, disaster, essentially. So anyway, I interject here. I see that, but in the case of pandemic, that's not even in the state that I understand. And if it is, what is pandemic? Pandemic speaks to a cross-border, if nothing. It's actually cross-region problem outside the jurisdiction of the state. So, as you read this, if you start actually plugging in what they're talking about, these judges don't know what they're talking about, actually. It doesn't matter in the end relative to the rights of being asserted to stop the, the extension, follow the law, essentially, relative to the government itself. 
one department telling an agency, which is like a fourth department, you you got to follow the law on this stuff. That's not what we intended that way. But in the case of pandemic, which lasts month after month, the governor cannot rely on emergency powers indefinitely. So there's another limitation. How are they kicking the can down the road on you every month then? As I pointed out, it's not in statute and it's not in, in, in constitution to do anything you've been watching beyond either 14 days or 30 days on its own. There has to be a repeat statement with a new cause stated or a continuing cause. In fact, not label. COVID-19 is a label. Pandemic is a suggestion from a foreign non-governmental organization. How is the Wisconsin police... Looking at the governor's power through that is a mind boggler to me. Going on, emergency order 28 is a general order of general application within the meaning of the Wisconsin statute 227.01. It is a, it is a rule. The order is a rule here. And accordingly, the rulemaking procedures of Wisconsin statute 227.24, which protect people affected by DHS, GHS, I'll get it, DHS orders, were required to be followed during the promulgation of Order 28. So, folks, they made the order against you. They affected people, and they weren't done and promulgated correctly under the law. Should have been you seeing they had done that and stopping it months and months ago. And this allows you to step up when you see this and uh, find, and you'll be able to find out that they're going to probably try and do a rule as promulgated by the special procedures for it, and you need to be standing right there to say, no, you don't have the authority to base it on something called a label. The label is not the communicable disease. It's a part, an, one part element to determining one. But that's you to do that. See, they're giving you the option here. Notice that this is going to be coming in this order. It's protecting the people, these procedures. And they weren't followed, which means that an official didn't care to protect. She mealy-mouthed the statutes to believe that she could stay, get out of it. Furthermore, uh, Palm's reliance, here's reliance defenses right here, word reliance, on Wisconsin, Wisconsin Statute 252 for criminal penalties for those who violate Order, 2, 2, 8, order 28 is misplaced. She chose not to follow the law. Therefore, there can be no criminal penalties for violations of Order 228. So here, if you're going to just walk around with a bag of law, you copy these places with this case and say, listen, you haven't shown me a pro properly promulgated rule. But that's not going to work because they're going to promulgate a rule and try to push it back through. So I'm not saying this is the answer. I'm saying this is how you see and identify yourself how whether or not those rules and statutes are being followed when they lock you up and take your liberty uh, and you say, well, I have, uh, that's not supposed to happen. That's not constitutional. In this case, it wasn't statutory. Let's go on with a little bit more because we're going to come up with the term. Wisconsin Statute Chapter 252. Chapter 252 addresses communicable diseases. Communicable diseases. There's two words there, folks. You've got to listen to this. You have to see what I'm saying. It's right there. That chapter addresses communicable, and I'll say this, and disease. Because you're going to find the rule and the definition requires that those two terms are not superfluous they're not redundant they're not, they're exactly those two terms have to be together and they're separate palm relies on the wisconsin statute 25202 for the legitimacy of order 28 as explained uh, as already explained palm was in error to assert that she has not required to comply with rule making or procedures however because we granted review on the second issue presented by the legislature we assume, arguendo, for the sake of argument, that rulemaking was not required and consider whether Emergency Order 22 exceeded the scope of permissible actions at 252. I'm not going to read more there. I'm now going to move down. Uh, you see there's a, the agencies have to follow the procedures prescribed by the legislature. Legislature, and I'm re hearkening, um, reminding you now what I talked about when I was speaking about the Oregon condition, where none of those things were, none of those legislative procedures were followed. And yet everybody also took notice of what's going on in Oregon and the destruction going on there. 
And I need to have people understand that's a democratic majority state. I mean, it's just there's nothing, there's no inroad on that on that democratic party, and really people that are singing the the green agenda and there are the infiltrators and the uh, the treasonous. I don't know. I'll start calling them names here. Um, these people are not cool, and they're not really party. They've infiltrated these parties, and people are too ignorant to, of how that's gone on. Something I've been talking to you about for for decade. But the, the issue goes on now. We're going down to page 116. So you see, there's a legislature that has a rule. The agencies have to follow it. Some agency bureau rat decided that she didn't have to follow the procedures because she can use the word order instead of rule. Supreme Court says, no, no, what you do is rules in this regard. It's general. It's got to follow the process to do what? Protect the people. And so that's your very first thing. You didn't follow the rule. You didn't protect the people. And me, me particularly, is how you have to do this, as you'll find out here in a moment. But each one of you has to do this. Now, let me read. They talk about police power in this in this regard, in this case. I want to touch it. 19th century legal luminary Thomas Cooley described the police power this way. The police power of a state, and they use a capital S here, is of a state is a comprehensive, in a comprehensive sense, embraces its system of internal regulation by which it is sought not only to preserve the public order and to prevent offenses against the state, but also to establish for the intercourse of citizen with citizen with citizen those rules of good manners and good neighborhood which are calculated to prevent a conflict of rights and the and to ensure to each the uninterrupted enjoyment of his own so far as is reasonably consistent with the enjoy, like enjoyment rights by others. There's a ton of things to look at the inside this. I'm only going to touch a couple because I just can't do the analysis on this broadcast. Not enough time. But you see here the conditional words that allow you to come in and say, but this has harmed me. These, the way they've done this has harmed me. Not only is it promulgated wrong, not only, only do they do not have an actual cause, but this is harming me. It's an offense against the state and how is the whole people. When it harm me, you're destroying the public order because you're inciting by your bad rules. You're inciting the public to stand between the cops and a waffle and a waffle house. Inciting people to come in and we'll find out another salon goes down. I didn't even know about it. It's been over 10 days. Another salon went down. We heard nothing about it. Dallas wasn't messing with Dallas. It wasn't the only one. Happens to be in this state of Oregon here. And that I talked to you about had no doesn't follow any of the procedures, and no one says anything about that. But the police power of the state is written here. You heard that. There's a balance going on. But you also hear the savings clauses relative to what your rights and the public, so-called, the general public, and the state itself, and you have uninterrupted enjoyment. Well, they're interrupting your enjoyment, aren't they? And they don't have a cause. You don't go in and say, well, their the statutory uh, rules are no good. You're saying that the order itself is no good because it has no lawful cause. What? The communicable disease. It has none. And we'll get to that definition to show you how simple it is to point out that they haven't declared a communicable disease. The, those, are, those are two elements in that word. Communicable and disease. They got the disease. I'll just tell you that. Another hint. It's called COVID-19. But that's communicable COVID-19 tells you there's something missing, even if you say it like that. Just replace the word disease with COVID-19. It'll still tell you there's a problem. And this court recognizes communicable disease. It just didn't say disease. It said communicable disease. So police power has been dis, uh, discussed here. As Let me go on more. That was the fo a, a footnote statement to a bigger statement that says, United States Supreme Court Justice uh, uh, J John Marshall said in the 1824 case of Gibbons versus Ogden that the police powers of the state include everything within the territory of the state, capital S, state, not surrendered to the general government, including quarantine laws and health laws for every description of every description. In 1902, the court again sounded a similar theme, concluding that preventing a ship from docking due to a partial quarantine was reasonable exercise. Here's your standard of reasonableness, reasonable exercise of Louisiana's police power. And in 1905, the Supreme Court went even further and concluded that the mandatory vaccination, listen carefully close, 
Mandatory vaccination to prevent the spread of infectious disease was a valid exercise of the police power. That statement right there is what I've been telling you why you have to attack the order for not having the communicable disease it claims by using the label COVID. If you don't destroy that, they have the, the judiciary will come in and say the state has the right for mandatory vaccinations. If you keep focusing and saying my constitutional rights are violated, you are going to lose. And if you don't quite get me and you want to fight me on this, you're going to see some trouble. The power of the state government is not without limits, however. Well, here we come. This is what I've been telling you, how th there is this balance. You have to understand this. Your constitutional rights are not in a vacuum and presumed. Certainly not in a prison and certainly not in a, in a military prison. But at any rate, power of the state is not without limits, however. Every exercise of police power is subject to the limits set by the people through our constitutions. I hope you hear my voice partly. Finding that 30-day limit in the states, and we found in New York it's like six months. In another state it's like 30 days also, maybe two months. Finding the statutes are even less depending on the type of grant. Going and I saw showing you Virginia's constitution says maladministration. The people can move on that independently. That's the limit set by the people in your constitution. Why you can't disregard them, and you just can't give them lip service. You have to be able to articulate this right in there, coming right out of those words. Going on, the, court, the constitution of, a, of the state is to be regarded not as a grant of power, but rather as a limitation upon the powers of the legislature. And it is competent for the legislature to exercise all legislative power not forbidden by the constitution or delegated to the general government or prohibited by the constitution of the United States. Let me interject or offered as or preserved reserved preserved and reserved to the posterity for maladministration of all of all those branches it's clearly stated right there going on the federal constitution imposes certain limits on state action prohibiting slavery guaranteeing the right to vote for men and women 18 or older of any race and guaranteeing the right of to due process and equal protection of the laws among others well, there's a couple of them right there that you can just be throwing down in there. But those are the harms to you. That isn't our, uh, presenting the fact that there's no lawful order for these things to be interfered with. And more. Just tons. I would say pick the top five and run with those. And then run in the alternative. You start with the harms that you're suffering underneath the bad, uh, bad order. And then you show, well, even if the order's good, it's still wrong. And that's what you're seeing. These types of orders are what you're seeing out of the businesses suing to be staying open and the release of people. That's what they're, That's essentially what they're saying. They're not challenging the order. They're saying it's now in excess of statutory constraints and limits. The state constitution also contains many limits, some overlapping with protections of the federal constitution. Among them are freedom of religion, the right to hunt and fish. Do you know you had a right to hunt and fish, folks? Where would you hear that? What word did, that, did I have used behind a woodshed to show you that you had the right to hunt and fish? Oh no! You got to go get your, go get your registration. You got to go get your certification. You got to go get a license. Otherwise, they beat you down like they're doing right. Like the Fresno police, be, the police are being used as uh, administrative order takers in order to go beat down a Waffle House owner. The right to hunt and fish. Fascinating. Remember the term piscari. The right of piscari. You're not an angler. You're not a commercial fisherman. You're not in commerce. You're not. You're only doing it for subsistence. The right of piscari is the right to hunt and fish. The right to keep and bear, right to bear arms and a variety of protections for crime victims and those accused. All out of the Constitution. These limits are real and substantive. Neither legislative enactments themselves nor executive enforcement of otherwise valid laws may transgress these or any other constitutional boundary. Listen here, folks. This is a parenthetical quote from a case. This is what I've been telling you all this time. It's not about what you claim is your right. It's what you protect in your right. If a challenger successfully shows that such a violation in brackets of his or her constitutional rights occurred, the operation of law is void as to the party asserting the claims. Let me repeat the very end. 
the operation of law is void as to the party asserting the claims. The rest of you keep complaining as to the party. The challenging party asserts against their rights and the operation of law is void is the statement I've been telling you why we have to step up. You don't live in a presumption of innocence. You don't live in a presumption of non-effect. You don't live in a presumption where the laws don't apply. The laws apply and presume to the state, your father, the father of the country, to all you wards, to all you inmates, until you throw this off and where they want you to use their courts. And I've told you there's a potential problem, but for the most of y'all, you can still move into these things, use the rudiments of law like a habeas or in an injunction, and you see and you void the operation of law to you. An equity action can go to those similarly situated. Then everybody else has to show by affidavit that they are similarly situated for it to accept unto them. As I say that, can you imagine if millions of you in every state actually went to the courts to start asserting this? I think that just makes me smile even if you don't agree with the courts. Look at what you're doing. Why go in and stand between the cops? All of you stand. Yeah, a, a contingent of you stand between the code enforcement police. They're not supposed to do that, but they're doing it. And a waffle owner. The rest of you, go file your lawsuits to help that, uh, that restraint of liberty on the business owner and for yourself. Having to go do that. You're not free from associating as a go-between to stop the law, unlawful enforcement because the orders are have no actual authority for their police power, only presumed. Just like the COVID virus uh, is presumed, not proven. Uh, and among other of these limits, now generally understood to be housed in due process guarantees, due process guarantees, I've told you it's about the only thing you have left, any exercise of police power must be legitimately aimed at protecting the public health, safety, and welfare of the people. Due process requires that the means chosen by legislature bear a reasonable and rational relationship to the purpose or object of the enactment. If it does, the legislative purpose is, pro is a proper one and the exercise of the police power is valid. Of course, recognizing the potential breadth of the state power is not the same as applauding or affirming the use of the power. Whether the state can guarantee individuals forbid public gatherings, take drastic emergency measures during a pandemic is quite a different question than whether the government has used the power wisely or within constitutional limits. Moving beyond the boundaries of the potentially permissible use of police power, its mechanisms is also important to the case. The scope of the police power determines the potential le legitimate goals of the government action, that is, the policies that will govern the state. In our constitutional system, it is the legislature that determines policy choices in the first instance. Policy choices, not law, policy Right? One big police state policy. P-O-L-I-C-Y. Exchange the Y for an E. There you go. It's just warden policies here. And you've all agreed to all that. And then you get these bar associations delineating without challenging the authority where the limits are between the two, between the two branches arguing over the extent. In our constitutional system, it is legislature that determines the policy choices for the first instance. Parenthetically, the legislature, subject to a qualified veto of the executive, possesses all the legislative power of the state. It does this pursuant to constitutional power to enact laws. Following enactment of the laws, the legislature constitutional, legislature's constitutional role, as originally designed, is generally complete. Okay, so they're cutting off the legislature right here, and we're going to end the discussion on that. I'm going to move on. You've heard a ton of information here. I hope you're paying attention on how the force and effect works relative to you and that you, each one of you, are required in that state, and I'll tell you this is universal, why I've been telling it to you, that you have to step up with your rights, otherwise you have none. You have none as against the general application. And so those of you that complain, my constitutional rights, my constitutional rights, it's illegal, it's unconstitutional, you're blowing smoke. 
You're saying nothing. And you're seeing. You're quarantined. Well, unless of you, those of you that feel great that you walk around and I'm not being, I'm not listening, I'm going to go la, la, la and walk down the street. That is not an assertion of your rights. That becomes you the target if they choose. Like they're going to, I hope we get here to the woman in the, in the Oregon. You see how vicious this becomes. Just organized criminals and these people that don't operate in law anyway. That's how we identify them. The agenda. These foreign agents in our land. These are the ones that don't care about the law. They don't care they're violating the law. And that's why I say there's a fundamental change that's happened in this country relative to presuming that the government does right all the time. At any rate, moving on down into page 149 at paragraph 240. It's, uh, in its briefing, the, the, the Supreme Court of Wisconsin goes on to say, the, in its briefing, the only harm the legislature offers is the right to suspend administrative rules it finds objectionable. Now, this case here is talking about your standing. Uh, they go through quite a bit of that. And they're saying this, there's not much that the legislature has for standing, and they just said that once the laws are made, it's ended. Now, it moves on. And those that are harmed have to assert they've been harmed in excess. And, and it's not equal rights. It's only the rights you put forward. This is the interesting problem here. First of all, you don't get equal rights to the other guy, unless it's an equity case that you can say I'm similarly situated. You still have to go in and get those. They're not extended to you, as a pre, even as a presumption. But in its briefing, the only harm the legislator offers is the right to suspend administrative rules it finds objectionable. That's it. They allege nothing else. Then there it is. There's a statement. You only get the harms, uh, remedied the harms you state. And this, be, this led patriots, so-called, to write massive paperworks of all the harms, all the things that go wrong. And I looked at that and said, that's just, like, beyond. This is how wrong the whole problem has become. And that's why I keep telling you, limit your workload, because you have to prove all that. Limit your workload to the top three or five. Even if you have only one, that's fine. But, I mean, just if you've got a raft load of stuff, you've got a freighter load of harms, don't try to defend all of them. Find your most effective ones only because of the workload. But don't walk in with too little either. Don't walk in with one or two and think that's going to do it. Okay, so we see even the legislature with all their attorneys. They only alleged one right. They alleged nothing else. And so the court's not going to go any further. But this harm is wholly inapplicable to the issue, which concerns only the execution of enforcement of laws. So they brought one issue, and it wasn't even going to be listened by this court. They're explaining here what standing is for y'all and them, and the legislature, that the people, the whole people is the legislature, not you. When you do enough word reading, you'll see how this thing's been wired why it is the way it is, but uh, going on here, economic harm to individual citizens and businesses may be real, but it is a, not a harm to the legislature as a constitutional body. There's a limitation as a constitutional body, possibly in a different status claimed it could, possibly. They're not talking about that. They're saying citizens are having businesses have different citizens and businesses here as well, uh, together <laughs> as one. Uh, have uh, have may have harm, but that's not to the legislature. They're back to the private rights and standing. And that is uh, going on, and that is the only kind of harm that can establish the standing necessary to raise this claim. Parenthetically, a litigant must assert his own, excuse me, a litigant must assert his or her own legal rights and interests and cannot rest a claim to relief on the legal rights or interests of third parties. How many times have I told you that, folks? This is what the, this is the what you read. This is what you find out. Each one of you vindicates your own legal rights and interests. You can't rely on third parties. You can't rely on the silence either here. The assertion of them, the challenge, is a do, not a think, not a feel, not a complain, not, not, a, not an attack other people. A uh, quote going on, 241 here, a sad feature of our government is that the executive branch sometimes acts outside its administrative, statutory, and constitutional authority. There's the authorities you press the, against this uh, executive 
that this is, of course, not a commendable state of affairs. We need a more perfect union, folks. They're saying it right here, but going on. Sometimes we, the people, respond by persuading lawmakers to change the laws. Here is he's now the judge, and I think this might be in dissent, explains what you have available to you. Sometimes we, the people, respond by persuading lawmakers to change the laws. Sometimes we throw the bums out. Sometimes we respond with protest and argument, sometimes civil disobedience. In extraordinary, extraordinary, for those of you on the em emphasis, in extraordinary situations, even revolution may be justified. See the Declaration of Independence, U.S. 1776, but the ordinary legal remedy for executive branch overreach is for someone personally harmed by their outreach, overreach to seek judicial relief. If a business ordered closed wants to challenge the authority of the executive branch to close its business, it may do so. If a person wanting to travel wishes to challenge the authority of the executive, he didn't say agency there, executive to forbid travel, she may do so. If a church wanting to challenge the authority of the executive branch to shut down Sunday services, it may do so. This is the way our system works. And it ensures a careful adjudication of the issues based on specific harms, not theoretical broadsides. This also ensures the courts enjoin only unlawful executive action. In order, if Order 28 does not need to be promulgated as a rule, then presumably, presumably, presu presumably, folks, there are presumptions here. Some of its commands are lawful. The legislature appears uh, to acknowledge statutory authority to close the schools and churches and forbid other ga public gatherings to control outbreaks and epidemics. Wow, they didn't say pandemic there, did they? They used the two words I told you are prerequis prerequisite to that word. They used outbreaks and epidemics. And then they cite a Wisconsin statute. I'm going to tell you folks in Wisconsin, your 252 is what I'm talking to you, where I referenced here last week Oregon's uh, other statute was 344 or whatever the heck that was. And we're going to go to those definitions here coming up in a moment. Okay, but going on, it's, just, it's clear. I don't even know what the question is. Why we're quiet all this time. Court, in this decision, why I'm reading it so you can hear it, is not me just telling you to go run, run willy-nilly on some opinion. It's the standards under which the occupier you live under is going to address your problem. And if you don't, a challenge, you have no rights. You have what you will be given to the rest generally. So, this court recognizes pandemic as distinct from outbreak, as distinct from epidemics, as distinct from the specific communicable disease. And yet, you won't hear them discuss this at all. That's the failure that you have to fix for you. Because these attorneys won't do it. Just as I've said before. Where did I learn that? Because the attorneys attempting to protect minors can't. They always work from the administrative side to which a grantee is not subject. And the failure can be delineated and shown in clearly, and they refuse to see that. And when you show it to them, they abandon the case. I don't know how many times that's happened to us. We're asked to give an interpretation of how it's supposed to apply in the law relative to a minor, what's being happening to him, to the federal government or whatever, whoever wants to charge them with a crime, we explain it, and the attorney will abandon the case. And I can only suggest, well, we were told they, they are trying to negotiate with the prosecutor, and our comment was, well, how, why are you negotiating when there's no actual cause? What's the negotiation of it? Well, the problem with that is when we tell them how it's supposed to be, they're now knowledgeable about how it is, and now they're liable for the continuing harm. And so they, they jump. And none of these attorneys will do the right argument. And I'm yet to see it. I want to see it. I want to see these people become lawyers and actually defend the republic and they're centrally located to do so. In fact, I've just, I don't know where that came from, but 
I mean, what, what, what their impetus was, I think somebody, a household or a group of attorneys somewhere is actually suing the government. I haven't looked at their case, but finally, five months, five and a half months later, the people in the position of understanding the law the best finally come together to say, wait a minute, we gotta, we got to stop something here. I don't know what it is. But for your private rights, you can't wait for anybody else. And if you think you have constitutional rights or something's illegal, you're wrong until you prove otherwise. You prove otherwise. That is your burden. But how would, they, they go on here, but how would this apply to a large sporting events, small coffee shops and open-air tree farms? These are hard questions, and having litigants who are able to present specific harms and specific burdens ensures we remedy only unlawful enforcement efforts and do not sweep more broadly than is necessary. So when your crickets are out there, they're sweeping to clean you out. They're sweeping like crazy. Their floor is absolutely clean because you didn't even make a cricket sound and say, wait a minute, you don't have the right to even sweep me out of the corner I'm sitting in. No, this you... Uh, confronting, challenging that system is what the court puts on you to ensure that there's no more broad sweep than necessary. And I'm looking at a nation lockdown. It's pretty pathetic. And I'm getting irritated really fast, right there. Uh, I think I'm going to stop reading that right there. I think we have enough. You can read it. It's 161 pages. I just jumped in a couple spots to show you. They're more important to me to show you what people will deny, will people try to excuse away. If you want rights, you have to be the challenger to argue, to protect your specific harms. And they can be anything that you have decided they are. You know, that my, just as a, an aside real quick, maybe we'll get to it here real quick here also. The, uh, you know, they want to say the government is a non-essential. They want to declare non-essential. If you have a property and they declared non-essential and made your property valueless, they violated the takings provision. And they didn't compensate you. That's another angle here of the harm. If they want to call you non-essential, they have to pay pay for your non-essentiality. And it's going to come with a dollar value. And we wouldn't be having these people being arrested or having code violations. You would be paid for not doing what you're supposed to do. We would then get the populace looking, well, you can't pay the farmer not to not to build, grow food. We wouldn't eat. We've got another problem that, that that would now develop. And if we had an integrated population, a populace, a vigilant mass of people that would stop this excess, ensure the limitation, it, folks, it's over quick. I just really, there's a little joke keeps going to my little happy face. Millions of you running into your courts to assert your rights. I don't care how you did it. Assert your rights against these. And I'm just suggesting, make sure you go after the order to eliminate the order. So they can't do, there's no balance to an invalid order. The operation of law ceases there, folks. Right? That's what you heard, right? In that, all in that reading. And there's a ton more in that thing, in that, as there usually is. So, uh, moving on, Michigan. Now we move to Michigan. <laughs> Amazing. When you fight, folks, you get, you get something back. Michigan judge sides with Barber, rejects Gretchen Whitmer, demand to close shop. Attorney General goes on, and we're talking here, one of the stories that go down. Uh, the AG asserted Mankey's open business presents clear and present health, present clear public health dangers. He asserted that they, he presents the barber, um, presents clear public health dangers. The barber won, folks. The assertion of the attorney general stating the guy was a vector for health dangers did not stand against the argument that the barber placed to assert his rights to do so, part of which were stating no challenge to the order, compliance with its measures. In other words, six-foot distance and whatever all else they, they, they did. Once the barber said I was going to comply with the order and they beat me down some more, the court said that was an excess. That man researched enough, at least even an attorney, to limit and ensure there was no excess on him. Now they're claiming can it go to others. Well, it could. You're gonna, that'll, when you get these kinds of cases, it won't actually apply to you uh, if you're not this party. But what it does is the agency backs off because they know that you're going to be suing them again. They don't want to be sued. They don't really want to be pulled in on things like this. Okay, but the AG, the AG's office itself asserts that he was a clear public health danger, and it didn't fly. So you got to weather these uh, these fraudulent accusations, and you got to have your case together. 
A Michigan judge allows barbershop to open despite lockdown as sheriffs refuse to enforce Governor Whitmer's orders. Here we have again, only I just wanted to point this out without going through the belaboring the story, that the sheriffs, the enforcement officers, uh, the law enforcement officers are also critical to help you. If you can get it, I don't know that they, they will. You have to assert your rights. You have to try to elicit the help from the people. Government agents uh, would be helpful if you can turn them away from wanting to come attack you like they, we heard that they will do in, in Fresno. So you got to have a mobile group. It's not just a bunch of patriots stopping between, stepping in a doorway between you and the cops. It's, that has to happen as well as bunches of people have to go in and start filing papers and doing negotiations, uh, not necessarily negotiations, more than educating the public, uh, the, the official, as to what's really going on. And if you take down this definition I'm going to tell you here, we've got to keep moving here, uh, you'll be able to quickly show people in line item sentences what the real point is. It's not that, oh, you want to open your business and feed your kids. That's the wrong answer. First of all, they're doing it, and they know you don't have kids, uh, you have kids to feed, and they don't care. So why are you bringing that one? And so this Michigan st st uh, rep uh, report has some interesting facts. Again, a gentleman, the 77-year-old uh, barber, Carl Menke, is the guy who wanted his, his place reopened. He just couldn't take it no more. Well, great. Fantastic. That's what you have to do. But they didn't do it. They, they said that they implied, or they said that the, they would comply with the, with the overall order, which I'm suggesting to you that is not proper and how to simply get at that. It won't be the only thing you'll bring. There's just a gob that, they, you know, the, Im, the improper application of the, or the non-application of the legislature's directives and or the constitutional violations is what you'll be also putting in there. But uh, this other, other statement, action, another story references from the Mankey case, that uh, Shelley Luther case in Texas. Mankey's uh, case is reminiscent of Texas salon, salon owner, uh, Shelley Luther, who received a seven-day jail sentence and $7,000 fine for refusing the court to follow a court-issued restraining order to close her business during the shutdown and non-essential businesses ordered by uh, Governor Greg Abbott. We went through that story last week. What I found interesting, why I'm even talking about this, besides being a stepping stone to the next one, again, there was a barber, the Shelley Luther's Texas salon over, are you seeing something here about uh, cutting your hair and glamour and this and that and the other here? An interesting, to me, an interesting correlation. These are the only people that believe they have a, a, a strong uh, non-essential, non an, an essential business that are willing to step up. This, this glamour, civilized, if you will, look at the world. I found this interesting. The... Uh, you got to look pretty instead of be pretty, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, this other extension here got my attention as well. And I we, I can't be able to qualify it. There's evidence that it didn't actually happen like this. But this is something that I found was a serious problem. Luther was released earlier after Abbott and the Texas Supreme Court intervened. I don't know that that's actually happened that way. But he said this is what it also said. The state Texas, Atter Texas State Attorney General Ken Paxton paid her fine. Now... A friend of mine read to me a statement that there was a deputy of attorney that put money in a in a Patreon account or GoFundMe or something like that. It was not really to pay the fine. That's what I heard. My problem with this is if the state attorney general or even the deputy is paying the fine, that is a serious defect. They should never have they be doing like that. I'm not if they didn't fine, I guess. They sh this is the appearance of pro impropriety influence also problem. But if they pay the state or even on his own pocket paid that fine, what is the habeas for? You've agreed the fine was correct. You're just disagreeing with the insult you just agreed to be doing against the judge. If they paid the fine, they've agreed to the charge. If that happened, it's no doubt why the Attorney General would have when I told you they're protecting that governor's order. They're protecting a Republican governor. He's a Republican t Attorney General. And there's going to be tongue-in-cheek. We're going to do this. The, the answers will come out. The lady will be free. And this thing kind of goes away, but it's been done incorrectly. So I'm hoping that that's not what happened. I just wanted you to, when you read that, that's a big problem that they pay that fine. That fine should never be existed. And the reason why it may contain, continue, because they're not challenging that Republican governor's order for him being invalid. The barber 
in Salon. We now, I find out back at maybe 10 days ago in Oregon, another Salon owner defies closure order, opens the, her business, and is now threatened at the time of this reporting, which becomes, which they, they actually then fine her, not this much, but they threaten to fine her $70,000. What is it with all, in this place is called Glamour. There's some glamour solutions or something. What is it that these, uh, we got barbers and glamour looking, you know, it's all about looks. What is it about this that no one else is stepping up? A little, a little background on this story. The best story I found was PJ Media and because they gave me the name and they gave me more of the story that I could figure and track down some of this uh, relative to the people themselves. Lindsay and Scott Graham own four tanning shops, a hair salon, and a gym in Salem, Oregon area. Like most small business owners, they've been financially devastated by Oregon's lockdown orders during Wuhan coronavirus pandemic. They at least kind of give us identification where it started as the coronavirus and a pandemic. That's that's international, though, see, on this story. But having little recourse and needing to support their family, the Grams have announced that they will be will open their hair salon uh, b- uh, back up in defiance of the closure order uh, by Governor Kate Brown. In response, the State Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, threatened her business with closure and a $70,000 fine. So now you see again, this is not the uh, not the go- uh, governor's order, but an administration agency, administrative agency stepping in in to in, a, in in place of that. You see him very carefully protecting those governor's uh, orders. And I don't uh, read more. So we got some another salon or owner and there's some words coming in my mind. They're not coming to me to explain about what the salon is, what it represents in our society, in the barber. Uh, there's something here about this, that uh, these are the only ones that are in the news, when every one of you should be up, as you just heard the Wisconsin case. And I'll just tell you, those standards or principles I've learned in all sorts of uh, discu- uh, court case re- opinions, why I focus in on them, and those are consistent across the nation. So don't just think those that I was reading to you are s- only restricted to Wisconsin. Those standards and principles are across the, the, the country. And you hear me repeat them all the time in trying to get people to do something for themselves, protect themselves. Another story here, a salon owner who was reopened despite Oregon's stay-at-home orders has been fined $14,000. So she did open her... Uh, her, she's mentioned here, her husband's not so much in this story, uh, Glamour Salon. We're promoting this glamour thing as well. I'm not a, uh, th- That's not my point of the contention on all this. I'm just pointing out there's a theme here that I find is very interesting, and it's um, indicative of something else that I, I, I'm not really, it's not coming to me right now. I'm uh, going on. Lindsey Graham, uh, who, owns, who runs Glamour Salon in Salem, Oregon, reopened her business on May 5th. So I just finding out about this yesterday. I was doing a total different search, and this story popped up. Uh, completely, obli- we did, I didn't hear anything about this while the Dallas um, st- salon got taken down. But the receptionist at Gl- a Gal- a Glamour Salon con- confirmed this $14,000 fine uh, to CNN and directed the further questions to Graham's email. CNN has sent an email to Graham seeking additional comment that I wanted to point out are n- not really what you say. The PJ Media, defi- you know, saying it's defiant. That's not. You can't approach this at all like that. You, I know it's in some people to be defiant, but you can't. You can't lead with your chin like that. There's a better way, actually. And you don't have to lead with your chin. But a spokesman for the Oregon's Occupational Safety Health Administration, or OSHA, uh, confirmed the fine and said the a penalty reflects, quote, both the nature of the violation and the employer's willful decision to violate the law. That was a critical statement to hear from that agency. Again, not the governor. This is the agency, which you see is going by potentially in this state, potentially different set of uh, rules here. I think everyone's trying to figure out how OSHA actually implements this governor's order. Notwithstanding, they looked at something here, folks. Both the nature of the violation and the employer's willful decision to violate the law. That's the defiant statement. You can't do that. You at least have to come with a word in your mouth over how the governor's order is not valid to you. Even if you have it wrong, the fine can't show willfulness when you have a plausible answer. This is what the lawyers do. Give a plausible denial. That answer will work once. It would have worked here, except they're coming out to promote this defiant condition. You're not defiant when you've assert that it doesn't apply for good reasons. Reasonable things as well. They could even be imposed but not reasonable. 
And this woman comes up and says as well, I want to feed my family. That's all. That was also the wrong statement. She hasn't figured out, like most of you all, the government doesn't care about you. If it cared about feeding your kids, it wouldn't lock you out of your way to feed them. And this case is particularly onerous and com criminal because of what happens next to this lady in, in trying to get her salon open, opening it, having 26 different contractors involved, private contractors, then the state comes in and is going to attack each one of those stylists against their license because of the willfulness of the disregard of the violation of law. There was no statement of challenge asserting the right, even to the agency here. And going on with the OSHA, she is unquestionably operating in violation of the government's executive order, designed to protect workers and the public. See, if you don't speak to that, you're saying nothing. You got nothing. You're not asserting anything. You're not going to be protected. There's no ensuring of the narrowing of the application. You haven't asserted your, your rights. They claim non-essential. They claim that go governor's order. That order has to be challenged for its validity. Anyway, going on to, without reading more, the, the woman has a, a new baby who, who uh, says that's what she's trying to provide. Her and her husband are trying to provide. Guess what happens after that? They sick the child services on these people. And they start integrating with that. They start to attack her on that. They attack her, his family, her, her baby. Uh, that's not, I've already told you about that situation. That's not a real good one to try and fight, but you see what the government does. These are organized thugs, organized criminals. They're no different than sending Guido after you. And now they start heaping up on you, like I've told you you have to try to avoid. And until they start, stand up and show that that law is questioned, this, well, CSD is going to continue on them. This is not, this is a dog, a pack of dogs. They can still start to make that record of felony under the color. But I don't think, when I see the words that these people use as they're being reported, people don't understand any of what I'm telling you here, what I've told you for a long time for many years. What to do, not just to complain about it. So let me move over about challenging that order there. These people are in some real trouble, I'll just tell you. Um, and, and this is the kind of thing, after a bunch of people get involved, I found it very difficult to communicate with anybody to try and help them out at all. And yet it's so, in my, okay, in my measly pea brain, it's real simple. Let me go down and refine this whole thing again, down again. Back to an even simpler condition. If uh, I've been trying to tell you about how we go through the statutes, how you read them, um, how you go through to make sure that, what, um, you make you make sure that you have what you need to protect yourself before you get there. How you don't lead with a chin. You don't get in jeopardy. How you set things up. How you start looking at the laws in order to move out whether or not due process is followed. I told you that's probably the only thing you're looking for. And so we're looking at due process. We go try to find the statutes that's there. And uh, that these things are, uh, this order is supposed to be under what they claim is COVID. If you read those stories, they talk about COVID. 19. They talk about without reference to the to the order, and it's in, presumed that the order, the governor's order, is is fine. But let's go to where the legislature has directed what such an order is supposed to be comprised of. Getting past the time, getting past the, the public health order that was supposed to be 14 days, or even the constitutional 30, or any other provision within it. Let's now go to whether or not an executive order for COVID can even exist as to invoke the police power. I turn myself now to the Oregon law, the Oregon legislature's website, and uh, I don't remember now what statute, oh yeah, that's right, 431A.005, and let's go to the term communicable disease. And I said earlier, anybody who uses the word uh, COVID-19 and, and says at all that it has, it, it's, something's related to it, something is as a causation for any harm or any kind of effect, any legal imposition, it doesn't know what they're talking about. And so this is where I'm going to now hopefully prove this to you. And it's in the term communicable disease. Let me read the definition number two. And let me say, in this, in this law as well, 
They have con a definition for condition of public important, health importance. They have disease outbreak, and they have epidemic. You won't find pandemic, all right? So they know about the disease outbreak, and they know about the epidemic. They also have the lesser standard that is a condition of public health importance. But they have this thing called a communicable disease at number two. Let me read here and listen carefully. Means, communicable disease means a disease or condition the infectious agent of which may be transmitted by any means from one person or from an animal to another that may result in illness, death, or several severe disability. Okay, you heard me read that. That's a one sentence definition. I don't want to go quite so far. I'm going to start, stop right in the first few words. That a communicable disease means a disease or condition, comma, the infectious agent of which may be transmitted. Disease means a disease. That's the word disease, incommunicable disease. They got it backwards. It's CD and then DC. The, the C, communicable, is what? Infectious agent. So here we have a comma. In this definition, you have communicable disease, and in the definition, you have disease that's communicable, called the infectious agent. Means a disease or condition, comma, the infectious agent of which may be transmitted. Now, you've heard me talking about this for a long time. You should be able to come up with the answer pretty quick. Let's interchange the terms that are plugged in as labels to make, see if we can conform to this definition, the elements required within it to even have a communicable disease. Means a disease. A start there, that's the first one, and then you have the infectious agent. Let's go back to the beginning again. Means a disease. Have we been defined the thing that they're calling the disease? Have you been listening close enough to understand what do they call this disease? The disease that we I keep pointing out is this thing called flu-like symptoms. And then they give you the list, and they keep expanding all this information against you. It's as simply as defining what is the disease. Now, they say it's flu-like symptoms, but what's the disease? They've given it a name. Everybody should have given me that answer, that I can't, even though I can't hear it. It's what? Is it coronavirus? No. Is it covid no. Why is it no, folks? Why is COVID not the answer? Because that's all coronavirus. Coronavirus could be any of the group of coronavirus. What do they call this disease? This disease is called COVID-19. That's a label. They got that, folks. There it is. Means COVID-19. Communicable disease means COVID-19, comma. First element, we filled the blank. Where's the second elephant? What, ele elephant. The elephant in the room. Element. The second element is what? The infectious agent. The communicable agent. The transmissible agent. They actually lower down there have a transmissible agent in one of the definitions. So we have COVID-19 to qualify one of the elements of that we have a communicable disease. The second one is identifying the infectious agent. Do you know what that is, folks? What is that infectious agent they've said? And do I even need to ask that? Let me just jump to the to the punchline. The infectious agent, we don't know. Because why? Because the CDC, with FDA in agreement, says there is no test for that infectious agent. What is the presumed infectious agent that we got from China? They didn't even make it domestic. There was no assessment, a domestic assessment made of this thing. It was what? They gave it a name. It was SARS-CoV-2. It was a serious rep rep respiratory syndrome, too, the second one they invented. Or not. Doesn't matter. There is no test. So here, let's plug it in. Means disease, COVID-19. And you kind of have to stop talking because there is no infectious agent. Communicable disease means a disease and zero was transmitted. Is not a communicable disease, folks. 
Now, I've spent quite a few minutes on this trying to beat this down because I don't think people truly understand what it means when there is no test. It means you cannot form the basis to fill the two elements. You can't even fill two elements to conform the the vector, the police power imperative, the demonstrable exigence, the demonstrated thing, cannot be a zero. It cannot be something you can't test for. It has to be an infectious agent, which has to have a test. You can't say it's communicable if you have no transmissibility in anything. All these orders fail on this definition. If I've had to come this far to tell you that, that you haven't even cracked a book yet to go protect yourself where the Wisconsin courts truthfully tell you, you only get the rights you assert, not complain of, assert. Assert. Challenge. You're living in a prison otherwise. Pretty clear. I'm not sure why this is so hard to understand. I think, uh, okay, I'm thinking a little pretty pretty highly of myself here. But if you heard the Wisconsin court say infectious disease, and then they disregarded the infectious part, then you're witnessing the court fail to identify an order that could be lawful. And nobody said boo about it. Nobody said anything about that challenge, and they told you in that case they weren't going to pay attention if you didn't challenge. Co communicable disease means COVID-19 and some infectious agent. It doesn't mean COVID-19. So, again, anybody who just mentions COVID-19 is doing anything, has any numbers, causes anything, has, has related this or that, doesn't know what they're talking about. Straight up. And I'm just using the definitions, folks. I'm just using one definition. If we can't conf confirm a communicable COVID, we have nothing to base any order on. I think is likely a better uh, discussion and presentation to someone who has to assert rights that they're being deemed underneath that order, underneath no real cause, no real definition, to be non-essential. I think your statement's a lot more powerful. You've put that before the court if you need to. And you, that's one of them. There's all kinds here. I'm just trying to point out a simple one, folks. How much more simple does it get? If you don't believe in what I'm saying, you can discuss it with me. You can send me an email. Mark on the beast at protonmail.com and explain to me how a label without a transmissible agent is a communicable anything. And they need a communicable anything would maybe be a condition of public health importance. Why? That's def definition number three. It means a disease, syndrome, or symptom, injury, or other threat to public that is identifiable on an individual or community level. If they have COVID, they qualified number three. It's just a disease. They just have to identify a disease. But it's not a communicable disease. And so you go down through these definitions, and it all spins on whether or not something's communicable, whether or not they can invoke this type of power. And when the burden's on them, in a habeas for sure, when you say they got their COVID, they got a label, they have their flu-like symptoms of the common cold, but they don't have an infectious agent they can prove to, and the CDC says there is no test, and the FDA agrees there is no test for transmissibility for infectious agent. So they're relying on a false warrant of authority, invokes those felonies, folks. How much harder is it to figure out? This is across the country. I'm absolutely sure these definitions are almost, I think they're model definitions. Everywhere I look, they're the same. I'm repeating myself because it's so important, and I think it's important to repeat myself because I see nobody, 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 nobody addressing it this specifically. And every week I come with a more, a better refinement and a better refinement, and I'm partly doing that to see if anybody would step up with their own research and see, wow, this is pretty simple. What, what am I doing in here? What am I complaining for? Why don't those barber, barbers and the, and the glamour specialists, why don't they point that there's no communicable disease? Why do the attorneys say, oh, we're going to agree to a pandemic? Did you see pandemic in here, folks? 
a condition of public health importance. Pandemic wasn't listed. So these are incorporated terminologies that are not relevant to the power invoking of police power. So, again, communicable disease means a disease, the infectious agent of which may be transmitted. I'll read it and plug in the information we have. I've got two elements to fill. A communicable disease, we can't even say that yet. We have to see whether or not we can pull the elements out. Means a disease. Okay, COVID means COVID. The infectious agent of which there is no test does not qualify this whole thing for a communicable disease. And that's when I ask if COVID-19 is not a communicable disease, and then what is the police power authority for? What is it? If it's still there, they're not talking. It was up to you to demand COVID-19 may exist as a label. You can call this stuff anyway, anything. You can call it, you can call it coronavirus bogus is the disease. And you can plug that word in this definition. Coronavirus bogus, the infectious of agent of which does not exist, gives us the same answer. It doesn't matter what the label is if there's nothing that you can prove infectious. If you don't have the infectious, you have nothing communicable to, to report on. You have nothing of, of community-level concern. You can't have an outbreak of something that doesn't exist, and therefore you can't have an epidemic, the limit of the authority. And so, have I wasted your time on this enough? Have I bored you to tears? Have you tuned away? Why are you all in your homes? Why didn't you just take what I just said in the last 10 minutes and write it down and have your paper digitally sent over to the courts? I want out of my house because I haven't figured out another way to do it. These are the rights I'm asserting against this fraudulent order. They did not assess. If you go farther in these statutes, you'll see that's why the county has to do an assessment. This authority should have come from the counties, and the county should have said, we can't handle it no more, and then the governor gets notified that way. And then they engage themselves together to resolve it. Because the counties can't help, they need the state help. And then when the state can't help, then it goes to the feds. Did you see that happening in this case? No. Okay, moving on. You can't, there is no test, folks. Why have I been saying that? Why have I been saying it's so important? Why do I repeat it where no one else repeats it? Because if you don't have a test, you can't find the infectious agent, which is required to invoke that level of power. And you've killed them all. You've taken them all out. And not to let this stop, because there's more. Once you even agree that there's stuff, there's ways to attack the validity outside of the fact that they haven't found an infectious agent, you then go after the way they would be testing it because they're going to come back and do that. John Rappaport brings up somebody, a gentleman named David Crow's brilliant new paper, takes apart antibody testing. There's really nothing in here that I want uh, more. You can read it. You, you need to see his paper. I would make one adjustment here. My adjustment is that when you go read what the test is, the RT-PCR test is, or the lateral flow test, they're checking for something. What they're not they're checking for, as I've told you, and I read it, and I read the, 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 the documentation, they're not actually checking for that RNA. And I would adjust uh, this document, uh, David Crow's document, to add the word hybrid af after when he starts talking of the test. And I think that's important because you have to understand they're not doing an RNA mirror. They're doing a DNA-RNA hybrid. They're not even looking at what the RNA of the original device is. The DNA um, construction and function is to attach caps on the end. When they replicate that, they're not replicating the disease. And so I would offer this why. You need to understand when you go, if you're going to go this far to show how the, the art, the, as you take the lead of this gentleman, David Crow, or even as John Rappaport will explain and explain to me where to go get the documents to read them myself. Remember, that's the links I gave you months and a month or so, two months ago, that one came from him, one I found relative to the serology test that shows that there's no test for COVID and there's no test for SARS-CoV-2. Why is there no thing for COVID? Because that's a label. It's symptoms that look like the common cold on steroids. It's a flu. 
But this is now uh, inter more information for you if you're going to now realize you have to go defend yourself. You have to do it properly. You have to do it within the constraints of what's offered to us. Uh, we have a gentleman who stepped up and given you another document. I'm going to ask you to understand to put the word hybrid, and you need to understand that, not just put it in, because I say so. When you understand the process and the biology and the test, not that I'm an expert, but I understand how the function now works and how I was able to come out before and tell you, you have to understand it's not RNA that they're mirroring. They're mirroring what the body does around the RNA in order to move it to the next step. And I think uh, uh, my sensation on the my intuition on this says what they're actually looking for is that DNA RNA binding. That proves there's been an immuno immunological uh, ev event. But that doesn't identify what caused the event. And so, getting kind of excited. This really information coming, even though it's been taking some time, real information coming that you can use. I think it ends and begin, it begins and ends at the identification that there's no infectious agent and none that can be proven. And you get governmental approval by their own documentation of the fact. Now, you can go get more and more to show why there's no tests or even that the tests they do are not valid, but that just builds into the idea there is no test, doesn't it? So that's a secondary step back. As powerful as it is, even by adding the word hybrid to understand, so you talk better than you than, than just everybody else, you actually get inside the how what the inventor said about that test. You start becoming the difference. You assert your knowledge, your rights, and against the uh, the oppressor who is looking for you to, and the courts are looking for you to ensure there's no overreach. If you don't think that doesn't describe a prison, I, I don't even know. But, okay, moving on. What is this that we're looking at? More information, very interesting. And this is what interests me. I told you if you get this one wrong as a diagnostician, diagnostician or, or a doctor or a nurse or whatever, uh, you'll kill people. Like climate change, all right? You get the wrong thing, you do it wrong, and you're going to be killing people. No, so you start spraying people and killing them because you think you need to shield the sun that's already now going out, you know, like we've been told was going to happen uh, by 2030. Autopsy, autopsies prove death by disseminated intravascular coagulation or pulmonary thrombosis. Uh, there's an article here from Dr. Robert Young. I think you need to read what he's saying. Autopsies are showing the cause of death uh, caused by disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC, or pathologic blood coagulation, and not viral or from SARS coronavirus COVID-19. Now, you see right there, he said it perfect. SARS, the cause of a, a coronavirus from the classic coronavirus represented by these symptoms. You see how that's perfectly stated? I hope you saw that. And he says not viral. So we have a vector that's not viral. What did the test say? Oh, we can take tests that are not viral, bacterial, uh, immunological responses. It's all right there. This is important because what he's starting to identify, the autopsies say there's something else people are responding to. I have another link real quick here about autopsy cases. The doctor talks. I want you to notice very carefully that he's talking about the 1% of the cases. Listen very carefully. All this is on 1% of the population. To that 1%, these this understanding is critical. If you don't understand what's going on here for them or they don't understand, so you need to tell people, and they're in this, 1% is in this condition, the lack of proper an answer will kill them. They need to know what this doctor says in this 12 autopsies video. And then I have one that I must watch debunking the narrative with uh, Professor Dolores Cahill. I want you to look at this video. This woman is a witness. This is the one you want the affidavit from. She actually says she'll help to prosecute, uh, to help be a, an expert witness to help people. I know she's in Europe. Maybe those of you in the States can invoke even an affidavit. There's going to be a process to make her relevant in your case. But this is the lady you want to list. You want to take down what she's saying. You want to make a transcript of what she's saying. And you want to start to analyze it for your utility locally. It's per, it's a really good understanding of how they're, again, uh, the artifice of the deal. And you, it's up to you to stop it. Grimner, thank you for what you do at RealLibertyMedia.com and all you do to help us out and keep us going. And uh, Jules over at UCY, I don't know, I couldn't get on the server today. I hope, it not, I hope it's not fatal. And all you all that are doing all these sub... Um, syndicating and I'll be with you tech diffs or nature willing
Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose. Can of whoop ass feels like. Son, he just opened a whole case of whoop ass.